um, the mass casualty and disaster lecture. Um, we're going to continue with the common biological weapons that we were just on anthrax um, in the previous video. We're talking about smallpox. Uh, smallpox is a virus that um, was around um, a long time ago, over a century ago, um, and it was extremely contagious and spread directly by contact um, with clothing and linens or droplets person to person. Um, here's the manifestations of that. Um, high fever, headache, backache, those kind of things. Uh, treatment is supportive care with antibiotics and additional um, infection uh, prevention, that kind of thing. Here's a picture on this next slide of what smallpox looks like. So compared to chickenpox, smallpox appears very similarly, but more severely and more uh, pustule-like. Um, chickenpox tends to look clusterous in little clusters rather than kind of dispersed all over. Uh, so that's a way to kind of understand where that's coming from. Next we're going to talk about chemical weapons. Chemical weapons often can affect people um, more immediately rather than the biological agents that take time to affect people. Chemicals um, are more apparent and occur more quickly. The table 73.6 shows um, common chemical weapons used for um, mass casualty situations and terrorism. Agents vary in their volatility, their persistence in, in degrading uh, the skin and, and affecting the skin, their toxicity level, how quickly they kill you, um, that's just a blunt way to put it. Uh, latency, how long it, it, does it does it kind of take a while on the skin before it starts to really corrode the skin, that kind of thing. Um, and then limiting exposure to that agent is one of the priorities there. Uh, limitation of exposure is the essential because if, if you if you're involved in an explosion that has uh, chem it's part of a chemical weapon. It depends on how close you were, um, how what was blocking, was there any protection at all, and how exposed are you to that agent. Some types of agents are vesicants. Vesicants are um, uh, chemicals that actually eat through the skin. Um, then there's nerve agents that actually can affect the nervous system and cause neurological disorders, numbness, tingling, a permanent muscle damage, muscle weakness, that kind of thing. Blood agents that um, actually go into the bloodstream and start affecting all the different organs. And then there's inhaled pulmonary agents um, that can start deteriorating the lung tissue and causing fibrosis and that kind of thing. Vesicants. Uh, lucite, sulfur, sulfur mustard, nitrogen mustard, and phosgene um, usually cause blistering, bruising. We were talking about vesicants a minute ago. Respiratory effects can be serious because it's going to deteriorate the lung tissue. Um, decontamination with soap and water, um, but not scrub or use um, any hypochlorite uh, solution. So it's very important that when when you're um, exposed to a person or a patient that has this on their skin, that um, you are knowledgeable about how to treat it as quickly as possible. Um, and usually there's a book uh, in the emergency room in every facility that we've worked in that gives um, information on how to counteract certain chemicals and what to do and what the protocol is. Eye exposure requires, uh, again, a copious irrigation. We talked about the eye splash um, eye wash stations in the ER and in the hospital, around the hospital. Treatments for loose site exposure is a dimer, caprol, IV, or topical, depending on the severity of the exposure to that agent. So I personally have not seen that, but it can happen, I'm sure. Nerve agents, we were just talking about those. Serine, Soman, Taboon, Organophosphates, and VX. They inhibit the cholinesterase, cholinesterase causing cholinerg 
cholinergic symptoms progressing to a loss of consciousness, seizures, copious secretions, apnea, and even death. Um, the treatment is supportive care, atropine, benzodiazepines, and prelido, pre, pre, I can't even say the word, prilidoxine. And I literally have never even heard of that one, but um, again, doesn't mean it can't happen. Decontaminate with a copious amounts of soap and water for at least 20 minutes. Um, it's important to know the treatments of the different types of things we're talking about here. Blot and do not wipe off, similar to lye. You don't want it to, um, it's kind of the opposite of lye actually. Don't wipe it off. Um, it needs to be pulled up from the surface. Um, plastic equipment will absorb in sarin gas, so um, that's not what needs to be where it's stored. It's going to be stored in probably metal or aluminum. Blood agents, hydrogen cyanide or cyan cyanogel chloride, directly affect the cellular metabolism resulting in um, asphyxiation sorry, through alterations of the hemoglobin. Um, it really can kill immediately. Blood agents, um, if used, are very dangerous. Um, I can't say as I would uh, see, I've never heard of anyone surviving it. So it can lead to respiratory muscle failure, respiratory arrest, cardiac arrest, and death, which is typically very quickly. Um, if, in a way, if you found out immediately what the patient was exposed to, they can do rapid administration of amyl nitrate, sodium nitrate, sodium theosulfate, and, and it's all essential after the patient is intubated and placed on a ventilator. So don't, you don't even wait for the patient to um, deteriorate. You just have to get them treatment. Pulmonary agents, phos phosgene and chlorine, both vaporize rapidly, causing pulmonary injury. So they, so they kind of like those vaping machines that people are using. It's, it's vaporized into a gas that can actually damage the lung tissue. Um, the pulmonary membrane that separates the alveolus from the capillary bed. Um, it disrupts, disrupts the alveolar oxygen exchange at that capillary level um, and cause uh, fluid to fill up in the lungs. Manifestations include pulmonary edema, which shortens the breath. I think many of you have seen that in uh, second semester, uh, not from the pulmonary agent, but hearing, so those are the symptoms that you're going to look for especially during exertion. Um, an initial hacking cough is followed by a frothy sputum production. So those are some things that you're going to keep an eye out for when um, someone's exposed to pulmonary agents. Radiation exposure. Radiation exposure may occur because of a nuclear weapon. Nuclear reactor incidences like the one at Chernobyl where in Russia where there literally nobody lives anywhere within that vicinity still to this day even though it occurred in the early 80s um, nobody lives there um, so it's very very potent and, and remains radioactive for a very long period of time exposure to radiation is affected by time distance and shielding types of radiation uh, induced injury are external radi radi irradiation or all or part of the body is exposed to the radiation. Decontamination is not necessary, not a medical emergency. Contamination, exposure to radioactive gases, liquids, solids, requires immediate medical management to improve the outcome of the patient. So if, if it's a known radiation um, contamination, um, usually there's a protocol in the emergency room where the person has to remain outside in a, in a, they have to set up a tent for decontamination purposes. The person has to be washed down um, and um, just decontaminated that way. Uh, uptake of the radioactive material into the body is where it becomes um, dangerous to all the organs and system and it causes failure of things to happen. In the next slide we're going to talk about um, Again, triaging outside the, the hospital, covering the floor, and using strict isolation pro 
precautions to prevent any tracking of the contaminant. Um, air ducts and vents are sealed. Waste is doubled. Oops, sorry. Waste is double bagged and labeled radiation waste because you can even admit you can even admit radiation contamination from your stool. Um, this becomes apparent also with patients like that are going through cancer therapy with radiation. Um, it's important for family members to know those things too. So radiation can actually continue to contaminate. Staff protection involves water-resistant gowns, two pairs of gloves, caps, goggles, masks, booties, and then a dosimetry device. A dosimetry device um, measures the level of exposure to radiation. Often radiologists and radiologist technicians will wear them on their uh, gown, and that um, allows um, healthcare uh, healthcare personnel to know the level of exposure for a patient with radiation exposure. So again, exposure is measured by time, distance, and shielding um, of the person when they're exposed. Your book on page 2209 actually goes into um, the levels of um, radiation exposure and what they what levels they can cause problems at when they're in your system basically so go ahead and read that page it's really interesting I don't know that I can I could uh, explain it as well as the book does so I'll let you read that one so continuing on from the radiation decontamination section patients are um, for outside the ER they're surveyed for radiation with that dosimeter and um, directed to the decontamination area um, decontaminating each patient outside the ED again um, tarps towels, soap, um, gowns, all this stuff is usually in some kind of kit that, um, and I forgot the name of it, it's escaping me right now, but each hospital that I worked at has had a, a almost portable tent for decontamination that they can set up very quickly, um, and it has all of these supplies for decontamination. Patients are resurveyed and resoured as, as many times as necessary to um, reduce the measurement of, that they're admitting of the radiation. Showering should be performed to not contaminate clean areas. That's why it's really essential that um, it's a contained area of showering. Um, Northwest Hospital actually had a decontamination room um, right off of their um, ambulance bay, so that was really handy. And of course, we never had to use it, but it was there in case. Um, biological samples like nasal throat swabs, blood samples are all part of that um, measurement of, to see the degree in which someone was exposed. Internal contamination requires additional treatment. Um, they have to be um, monitored, um, gastric lavage with uh, chelating agents. Um, uh, apologize, that's actually pronounced chelating agents and they're binding um, agents that bind to the um, ions in the stomach uh, and the gastric um, system. And then catharsis actually just means to purge or purify in the old Latin terms. So that's all it means is to get that under control. So a, a symptoms that you're going to be looking for for acute radiation syndrome uh, is a dose of radiation that determines which, it's the dose that determines what kind of symptoms or syndrome will occur. Uh, I remember when I was a kid back in the early 80s when there was the fear of nuclear um, mass destruction um, bombs being dropped by Russia when we had the Cold War going on, uh, there was a movie called V or V-Day and it, it basically uh, gave a hypothetical situation of a nuclear bomb hitting the world or it actually happening and some of the symptoms that they um, talked about in the show were what we're going to talk about now. All the body systems are affected, they present um, signs and symptoms, determine the predictability of the survival. So if it's milder symptoms then definitely they're going to they have more of a chance of surviving if the symptoms become really severe, then of course there's the fear of death on that one. 
Probable survivors had no initial symptoms and only minimal symptoms. Um, possible survivors present with nausea vomiting that persists for 24 to 48 hours. And improbable survivors are acutely ill with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and shock. Neurologic symptoms also um, suggest that there was a like a bigger exposure to the agent. Our last slide, um, we're going to talk about um, how triage in a disaster di differs from triage in an emergency room. And we discussed that early on in part one. So um, I'm going to have you guys um, take the time to go ahead and Maybe talk with your peers um, if you guys get together on any kind of Google Meet or if you meet up to um, study together in, in small groups where you're wearing your masks and social distancing. Um, you can discuss the triage of uh, different uh, that dis differs from disaster and from the emergency room. I apologize. I've been talking and talking for these videos, so my tongue is getting tied. And um, we're at the end. So again, I'm going to remind you all that you can watch the videos over and over if you want. Take notes. I am open to suggestions. If, um, if I have become too monotonous, let me know. I'm going to try to make these a lot more fun as we move along. Unfortunately, we are on crunch time trying to put these videos together for you guys. Um, so I really appreciate your patience and time with all of us. And again, I, I will get more exciting as we move along and we'll keep you interested. Uh, keep watching the videos, take notes, and have a great afternoon.